Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media, as well with an assist from the Ramjack Corporation. Um, today, uh, we decided we were going to, we got, we got uh, more positive feedback than I had anticipated the last time we did an AMA with, with uh, young Guy Denton, uh, my amanuensis and major domo at the American Enterprise Institute. And, um, uh, we just decided we were going to do another one today because we just, uh, decided to do that. And, um, I don't have to justify myself to you. You're not the boss of me. Nobody puts baby in a corner. So with that, uh, guy, uh, I mean, you're always sort of lurking in the remnant, like, you know, like, a a, a hobo at the bus station or, or that creepy dude in the, in the back carols of the library. But, um, Welcome back to a speaking role on the remnant. Thank you. Yes, lurking like the guy at the back of the movie theater. I think I think my lurking is preferable to Jack's lurking because I lurk from the shadows and I'm invisible from the recording. Whereas I imagine that in the old days he would just stare at you silently, piercing your soul with his dead eyes while you recorded, and that must have been slightly off-putting a lot of the time. Yeah, I well, I, that's why I, I re- did most podcasts when we did it in the studio with Jack. I just stared at my feet. <laughs> Because the the problem with Jack Butler is when you look into Jack Butler, Jack Butler looks into you. And um, uh, but uh, Christian uh, Christian Bale said about how he uh, perfected his role in in American Psycho, but he looked at Tom Cruise and tried to replicate the feeling of perfect eyes but had nothing underneath them. And I wouldn't say Jack <laughs> has perfect eyes, but there's definitely nothing behind them as he stares into your soul. Uh, yeah, well, he. he I'm sure he actually blinks. I don't think um, I've ever seen it. I just, I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, he looks at you very, very intently. You know who also has, and I've talked about this before on here, is uh, Tom Cotton. Tom Cotton has this thousand yard stare thing that when you talk to him, and like Mike Gallagher, you know, in Cotton's defense, lots of people tell me, oh no, once you get through his defense perimeters, he's a really, he's a nice guy and he's good to talk to and all that kind of stuff. Every time I've been in a room with Tom Cotton or talked to Tom Cotton, I think about that scene in Jaws where <laughs> Quinn is saying, you ever looked into the shark's eyes? They got doll's eyes. Lifeless eyes. Um, and uh, he makes me he makes me feel unsafe. He, he but, does look uh, like he's planning something, like he's perpetually on the hunt. I, I will say, though, that Cotton is, is, has gone up in my estimation over the years because I think he's actually a pretty serious guy. And um, um, would that I could say that about many other politicians these days. So, um, uh, where do you want to begin? Uh, well, good. And you can, you can, you can attest that you've been working fully with Coopers and Librand, the accounting firm, and I have not seen any of these questions. In the- as, yes, as always, Wolfram in the heart, uh, jabbed your hand with a blade, made you sign the contract in blood. So there's no more Shanshu prophecy and you haven't read these questions. I can verify. It's so sad that like when I first started making Wolfram and heart jokes, uh, People thought, oh, you're just trying to seem like you're young and with it. And like now it's just it just dates you. There's no like youngness to it whatsoever. Cause like kids that kids of these days don't know it. Oh, for listeners out there, don't be ashamed for not knowing this reference. You should be a little embarrassed by it. Um, I'm too old to know it and Guy is too young to know it. Uh but um it's it's a spin-off from Buffy the Vampire Slayer called Angel. And the the evil law firm, like Hell's Law Firm on Earth, was called Wolfram in the heart. Often confused with AEI. Uh, but we got a lot of questions, and c- quite conveniently, they break down into categories. I thought an interesting one, there are several book-related questions, and an interesting one that I thought it might be fun to start with was, a, a listener asks, what would you say are or were the most reasonable critiques leveled at liberal fascism beyond the knee-jerk criticisms that stemmed from its title? That's an interesting one. I'd have to go back and refresh my memory about some of them. I mean, there was a New York Times write-up that was friendly grading on a curve um, that thought it was too much muchness to it. Um, uh, Arnold Kling tried to split the baby, if, if memory serves, saying that it was sort of deliberately too provocative and trollish in its title and all that kind of stuff but at the same time 
There were some important arguments to be made in there. I remember having a deep and abiding problem with Michael Moynihan's review of it um, uh, at Reason, which on the whole was fair, but I thought he just took some, I, I can't remember what they are, some leaps. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, often, I mean, sadly, the more common phenomenon was a generally na nasty review with fair paragraphs inside of it. Um, although I have to say, you know, so the, what's his name? David Oshinsky, the guy who reviewed it for the New York Times, um, he was more fair than a lot of places. Um, uh, because, I mean, I, I, I've made this point many times since, you know, like there, I think you can, I think it's very easy to wildly overstate my influence as a quote unquote public intellectual. Um, and it makes me very nervous and creeped out when people try to talk in those terms. Um, uh, but I do think I deserve more credit than anybody else I can think of. Now that doesn't mean that I'm, uh, um, I deserve the most credit. I just, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes 10 years ago on this front, but I think I deserve the most credit for, uh, taking as much grief as I did and for mo helping move the zeitgeist against Woodrow Wilson. Um, again, I'm not alone in this. There are a lot of people been doing it, but I did it earlier and stronger um, than a lot of people. Uh, Ronald Pastrito at the Claremont Institute um, and Hillsdale uh, was a leader in all this kind of stuff, but I helped popularize some of his things. Uh, Glenn Beck picked up my stuff and, and popularized it more. Um, but anyway, uh, Oshin I think his name was Oshinsky, University of Texas professor. I always point this out to people. It's like, so his review did not disagree with anything until I got to FDR and he was an FDR historian. And a lot of people are like, you don't understand FDR. FDR had this really wonderful temperament and he was a much more complicated figure and he helped save American capitalism and American democracy and yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm open to some of those arguments. I don't think he's a demonic figure the way Wilson is, but uh, FDR was a, representative form of politics I did not like, right? He was essentially president for life, among other things. Um, all of the things that the left hated about McCarthyism uh, were uh, got their start under FDR, but when they were aimed rightward, no one seemed to care. Um, we can get into the weeds on some of that stuff, but because uh, the, like, the American Bolsheviks loved using the Smith Act against the Trotskyites, but then when the Smith Act was used against the Bolsheviks, they were all like, that's not fair. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, he, he had a fairly f reasonable uh, and approving take, or no objections to my stuff up through Wilson, which included my arguments about Hitler, my arguments about Mussolini, and my arguments about Wilson. And then he gets to FDR, and then Jonah goes off the, Goldberg goes off the rails with, with FDR. I think reasonable people can disagree with him on that. But um, uh, the reason I brought this up is that the headline for it in the Times was in the Times Book Review was Heil Woodrow, and it was supposed to be utterly mocking. Like, w listen to this crackpot who thinks that like Woodrow Wilson was not only a bad guy but actually kind of fascistic, if not the first totalitarian dictator in Western civilization. A point that, by the way, Robert Nisbet and others have made before me. Um, and uh, and now, like you're like Heil Woodrow does not seem like a something that you might not see at Vox or Mother Jones or someplace like that. So anyway, um, I don't know. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but uh, for the most part, um, it's like, and, you know, in retrospect for some understandable reasons, nuanced on the one hand, on the other hand, takes pleased nobody when it came to my book. So if you know, like Tom Sowell loved it, Tom Wolf loved it, all those, you know, basically everyone named Tom I respect loved it. Um, but if if you if you like this but hated that, it was difficult to to write that because you piss off the people who want you to completely hate it, and you piss off the people who want you to completely like it. And so I can't remember. I feel like again, I feel like I'm being unfair, but I will stop speaking. Uh, um, I thought this was a fun one. What is the most enjoyable thing about the process of writing a book besides the end result? 
Um, this is going to be different for everybody. Um, um, uh, I like going down rabbit holes. I like discovering something that I didn't know before that seems to work with my argument and then discovering that if you pull on this little line through these little intellectual subterranean cave tunnels, it opens up into these giant caverns and you're like, oh my gosh, look at all these things I didn't know. Um, I love that feeling. Um, um, and it's one of the reasons why I will end up, like with Suicide of the West, I would end up writing like 20,000 word chapters on some obscure point that my editor was like, yeah, this is not a chapter. Um, but um, uh, that's the thing I, I like the most about the actual process. I don't like the writing process of books. I like writing G-Files, okay? You know, I, I sometimes enjoy writing my syndicated column. Excuse me, but um, I don't enjoy the process of writing books. I mean, the actual writing part. I like the research stuff. I like being motivated and really into something and having some new thing to talk about and obsess on. But um, other than that, I just like the doneness. The doneness in the checks. <laughs> That'll be the title of your unofficial biography. <laughs> or your official biography. And it also sets up the next question neatly, which is, how do you feel about Suicide of the West five years later, looking back? Are you happy with how it turned out? Is there anything major you would change? Be you pleased with the reception? Do you think it had the kind of impact you wanted, et cetera? Um, I'm generally very pleased with it, I think. I think it holds up beginning to end better than liberal fashion does, fascism does, for sure. Um, I wish I had paid more attention at the time or had just moved up the pub date or moved down the pub date adjusted the pub date so that i could have addressed more squarely a lot of the new nationalism stuff because i think it was a little i saw it coming right but i by the time i'm writing about it it hadn't like spilled out so fully into the public square and i wish i had addressed more fully like yoram hazoni and um and patrick Deneen's stuff um i think that was a problem i thought the response re reaction to it um i don't think i got the reaction that necessarily like every, every author this is not sour grapes the book did well i'm happy about it but um you know yeah i'm pissed that like a bunch of places didn't review it like i, I like why the washington post didn't review it is a mystery to me um i don't think the journal reviewed it which i found to be a little bit of a betrayal but at that point you know that was part of the problem was that um um so many people wanted to pigeonhole it into this stuff about the trump stuff right because it was in the thick of you know i was very prominent as a trump critic um uh, unlike now where i'm a huge trump supporter um or and, just not uh, prominent at all as a trump critic depending on that's right that's right uh why not now everybody's in the pool so like finding trump critics is is it's like looking for who's not Waldo in the picture. Um, and uh, um, I thought that the, uh, again, I, I really don't want to sound like sour grapes because everybody, any, any book that makes any kind of splash has cheap shots taken at it. I think that's always been the case for everybody. Um, I thought the stuff that, you know, I thought Rusty Reno's attack on it was, I want to be really clear about this because you know rusty's apparently a prominent intellectual so it's really just juvenile and dumb um michael duran who's at the um hudson institute um in the process of running to the defense of emerald robinson a deranged uh hateful idiot uh conspiracy theorist who's been banned from all sorts of places but he thought she was writing wrote something brilliant that basically danced on on charles krauthammer's grave went out of his way to write this long piece about how uh, in defense of her by uh, attacking uh, Suicide of the West, and he does this long summary of the book as a, as a sort of zombie Reagan defense of Reagan, Reaganite foreign policy and blah, 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 blah. It was just a lie. I mean, it was a lie or he just uh, 
just guessed and thought it was true because like the, the word the name Reagan showed up once in the book and it was just a quote about you know the about freedom not about liberty not being um in our blood you have to fight for it in every generation or something like that um so the things like that that you know clearly I remember <laughs> um and uh but um but I was surprised, you know, American conservative gave it, you know, uh, given the givens, a, a fair and decent review. Um, you've all, this is, you know, um, I don't think he was at AI yet. Um, uh, gave it a really wonderful review, which I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful for. Um, but um, I think if I had to do it over again, I'd change the title. If I had, I go back to my working title, which was called the Tribe of Liberty, um, and um, um, I think I had, I think it was just its release was kind of poorly timed, given where the zeitgeist was, and I could have either done it earlier and gotten ahead of it and really sort of framed the debate better, or I could have done it later and responded to a lot of the stuff that had you know suddenly spilled out and taken over um, the debate. But you cannot. I mean, I know so many people who are much, much more badly screwed by timing with their books. I mean, I remember when Byron York's book about the vast left-wing conspiracy came out um, the week the Pope died. And, like, it, he just got screwed. And it was a good book. And he worked out really hard on it. And um, I've told this story a million times. On on 9-11, I want to give you my full what was I doing on 9-11 story, but, like, um, I was watching Fox. I was flipping around the channels the morning of 9-11. And uh, uh, on Fox and Friends, there was this guy. I can't remember his name. He was a Newsweek reporter. He had some big scoop about how, um, like, uh, Souter or somebody was going to change their vote on the Supreme Court and Bush v. Gore, and that was going to change everything. But then they got... They, they decided not to or something. It was something that mattered a lot because people really cared about Bush v. Gore back then. And then they were like, so glad to have you here. Oh, can you hold on one second? We have a report of a small uh, two-seat passenger plane hitting the World Trade Center. We're just going to go take a deep from that. They come back and say, okay, now tell us about your book. Wait, hold on one second. Um, it really looks like this is a more serious thing. I'm sure we'll have you back oh. on soon. <laughs> and I like, like, I don't know that anybody had him on again about that book ever because like no one was doing anything other than nine eleven stuff for two years after that. Um, so those things happen. It's always terrifying when you're working on a book because you really put your life into something like that. You know, you really pour your your heart and soul into it, and then you are just it's just up to the gods about what. Um, whether the news cycle is going to be friendly to you or not. Or whether people are even going to care. Or whether they can pronounce the name of your book, as in the tyranny of the Clitches case. That's correct, yes. It's 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 a crapshoot all the way down. <laughs> so. Punditry time. Uh, how do you feel okay. about the unfolding controversy at Stanford Law School? Is higher education doomed as we know it? Um, so, uh, if you listen to the the dispatch live I did with um was just me and Sarah um where she had she attended my talk at Sea Island you know where I did this whole thing about wokeness is essentially a, a veblen good or a positional good there's a difference um and uh she really liked it and wanted to talk more about it so we talked more about it I'm not sure I did a good job explaining it on the dispatch live thing but um I think about the Stanford thing in the context of all of that. Um, um, in so, so I, my basic argument is just simply that a big chunk of wokeness on college campuses, if you were a visitor from Mars, you would, or if you were a, a visitor from Mars is the wrong way to put it. If you were an immortal, right? Um, sort of like had the average a knock sensibility of there's nothing new under the sun every generation you know the patterns change but the the underlying phenomenon is the same um sort of like my argument about how like if you'd been around long enough you would recognize that 
North Korea is not a Marxist-Leninist dictatorship. It is basically a monarchy with an aristocracy that has notions of nobility and castes and serfs and all these kinds of things. The words change, but the underlying thing is the same. I think you could look at the stuff that goes on in a lot of elite campuses as um, essentially an exercise in class class and status differentiation where um, wokeness is essentially in a very expensive language, right? It takes a lot of effort and money to, um, I should say effort and or money to afford the ability to sort of speak it fluently. And in the 19th century, <coughs> never mind the 10th century, that language would be French. But we don't do that now, right? It like, used to be like if you spoke French, that was a sure giveaway. If you were an English-speaking country and you spoke French, it was a sure giveaway that like you were raised by sort of upper crust type of people. And, um, and now the sort of woke stuff is, in part, I'm not saying it's not a pernicious ideology or any of that kind of stuff, but in part of it, it is, look how rich I am that I can afford this really stupid bullshit. Um, and, um, I can afford really bad ideas or my parents can afford really bad ideas. And, um, you know, I've gotten to this guy, uh, Rene Girard a little bit, um, who I think maybe esoteric forbidden, um, knowledge kind of thing. But, you know, part of his point is that, uh, he calls it victimism, uh, um, you know, Others would call it um, victimology, right? And this is sort of, or just sort of um, the, the civilization, civilizational problem of, of guilt. Um, and, but regardless, he, goes, he, he has this thing about how victimism isn't really about concern for victims. It is about using the ideology of concern as a way to attain and hold on to power. And so a bunch of rich, progressive white people, disproportionately white people, um, who are so privileged, they actually talk all the time about their privilege. They actually confess their privilege, say um, uh, that they need to be empowered. They need to control the access points to these institutions because they're concerned about the right people. And the right has its own version about, you know, sort of white straight males being the new victims and and so a different set of elites claim that they deserve power because they're concerned about a different set of victims so i think a lot of this explains the sociology of a lot of 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 this stuff that said i think the stanford thing the thing that actually bothers me about the stanford thing um is i'm really getting tired i mean i don't, I, I i don't want David French to go all Obi-Wan Kenobi and sense a disturbance in the force here. But like, I'm really tired of these things being framed as first amendment issues. Um, uh, Stanford is a private institution. Um, and even at public universities, it bothers me how much this is done as a, as a free speech first amendment issue. Um, but regardless, Stanford, I don't know, is it the top three? law schools in the country. I don't know where its ranking is, but if it's below five, I'd be stunned. Um, and it's not a college campus. It is a professional school to train professionals to be officers of the friggin' court. And if the reports are true, I saw Ed Whalen had said something about this. If the reports are true that law school students said to a visiting judge, I hope your daughters get raped. Um, I don't think this is a complicated thing. They should be expelled or at least suspended or at least severely punished so that people in the future don't think this is something that does, this is the kind of behavior that doesn't have consequences. Um, there is, let me just tell you right now that like if there was a really important person who was visiting or a friggin' DoorDash delivery guy and you said to them, Guy Denton, <laughs> I hope your daughters get raped you would be fired and deported immediately. I wouldn't think twice about it, right? But like, particularly if like a visiting judge came to visit AEI and he's walking down the hallway to come talk to me or you've all or something. And you say, I hope your daughters get ready. <laughs> You're fired. Like, don't even clean out your desk. We'll ship it to you. You're fired, right? And like, similarly, there is not a law firm in the country that wouldn't fire a partner 
for doing something like that. Um, there's not a business in the country. Imagine having like working at a bank and a potential client comes in and you know, the head of sales says, Hey, I hope your daughters get raped. You're fired. I mean, this is not complicated and it's not a free speech thing. It is like just a common sense decency thing. Even and if businesses is poorly run as the dispatch would enforce that. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and um, like Steve and I would race past each other to see who got to say you're fired first. And no, I mean, like a church. I mean, imagine, I, I, you know, some churches, I guess they have to welcome all parishioners and stuff and like for, hate the sin, forgive the sinner kind of thing. But like if there was a visiting pastor and as he walked up the aisle towards the, the, the you know, the front of the church to give a sermon and you say, I hope your daughters get raped. Like it would cause problems, right? But like somehow we're supposed to think that this is the kind of behavior that makes you a better freaking lawyer. Like, like lawyers actually have to deal not just with opposing counsel that they don't like and that they disagree with, but their own clients that they don't like and disagree with. And the idea that th this kind of stuff is encouraged or, 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 uh, you know, at least uh, allowed to happen is insane to me. Schools are, most schools I am aware of, at least most elite schools, still have somewhere on the books like these things called honor codes and um and like speech I, again i am i i'm much less of a free speech nut than like i get lumped into because i just think the issue climate makes me more free speech than i actually am um but uh i am for absolute academic freedom for tenured faculty in colleges right i am for uh, academic freedom for students to ask crazy questions in the classroom, but not like, have you raped any nuns, professor? Right. I mean, like ask questions about the subject matter to raise un, you know, uncomfortable topics to explore different things. Uh, you know, when we had Keith Whittington on, uh, it never really had occurred to me before. It was that you sort of, you can tell where the sacred cows or the dogma are in higher education by what kind of issues test free speech and so uh or test academic freedom and so like academic freedom you know originally it comes out of like uh astronomy and science stuff because uh questioning the you know heliocentrism and all that and galileo and blah 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 we can do that all day long um because back then the the metaphysical dogmas about the nature of the universe and all that were the were the sort of the hot button issues and now like in science i think they pretty much get free reign to sort of do and say whatever they want though i i, I suspect um the whole what is a what is a female in the biological sciences is probably more controversial than it was five years ago um but the the dogmas have all moved out of hard science you know the, the taboo subjects have moved out of the hard sciences for the most part and into the humanities and um and into things like law and 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 um and I should say the social sciences too but out of the hard sciences and um and I think that just more broadly you know this is something I talk about a lot but this notion that somehow being a good um that it is essential to the college experience and now apparently the law school experience to be a protester, to be a dissenter, to like uh, speak truth to power and cause a ruckus and cause a fuss. This is just a garbage idea. Um, like I'm all in favor of protest when protest is warranted by the issue, but like protest for its own sake is another word of another word for jackass. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's like my problem with contrarianism. I'm all for being a contrarian when you're being contrary, contrary, to something that you think is wrong. But if you just take a contrary position without saying, hey, by the way, I'm taking a devil's advocate position, so let's, let's hash this out and have a serious conversation, that's fine. But if you just sort of really angrily and passionately and righteously um, take contrary positions to the larger group to just sort of stand out and be a rebel and be a dissident, you're a jackass. Um, or you're very likely to be a jackass. And... Um, and so I think a lot of our elite institutions are essentially teaching jackassery as an essential part of the educational 
process. And so I, if I were running Stanford Law, it would not be, um, if you could actually prove it, right? Because like lawyers are supposed to care about evidence and all that kind of thing. Um, but I would be just merciless on anybody who um, behaved as egregiously as that. Well, there goes my opening line to Yuval when I meet with him tomorrow. So thanks for that, Jonah. Uh, another <laughs> another question completely unrelated to that, but I don't think I've ever heard you talk about it before. Uh, a listener asks, what do you think of the American healthcare system? How would you reform it? Do you think any other country has a superior model that we should try and emulate or not? Uh, what are your thoughts, generally speaking? So fully stipulated, and this is, this is, this is not... This is not something I'm proud of. I, it's been a while since I looked at healthcare policy. Like in the Obamacare times, I read a lot of this stuff. I talked to a lot of people about this stuff. It was like the topic of conversation for a long time. Um, you know, at NR, we would write editorials about it. We would, I would write columns about it. I haven't looked into it too much lately, except as an entitlement problem. Um, that said, uh, having gone through what I went through with my mom, um, I am so skeptical of, of the ability to um, impose programmatic savings into Medicare, um, just seeing how the bureaucracy works. I mean, I, maybe like we just did this podcast with Phil Howard, you know, uh, maybe getting rid of a lot of the public sector unions and, 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 and making an, an, MF, an emphasis in making government work <coughs> efficient and um, intelligent and, and cost saving would work, but that's a long way from now. Um, and I think part of the problems with Medicare are part of the problems with are, are, are emblematic of big chunks of our healthcare system as a whole insofar as, um, well, first, I think we blundered in this whole you get your health care through your job thing. This is a classic example. This is one of the classic examples of what um, that prompted Milton Friedman to say there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program, right? And uh, during World War II, uh, when there were wage freezes, firms had to come up with a way to sort of sweeten their offers over to compete for workers. And so one of the things they did was they started making more generous um health insurance provisions through the job and then that became sort of written into the warp and woof of the industrialized economy i think that was probably a mistake um i i i generally believe that if you can put if you can make consumers of products actually care about price you get more efficiency, right? So this is the argument about why veterinary care in America is typically much better than human care, um, because it's a it's a fee for service thing for the most part. I mean, now pet insurance is getting kind of popular, but still, you're paying directly for it yourself. Um, you're not getting it through an employer or anything like that. Um, also, and this is something I have personal problems with, um, um, but the trial lawyers can't get at malpractice with animals the way they can with humans because there's a there's generally a five hundred dollar or that's the last time I checked five hundred dollar cap on damages for for uh, negligence with with animals and like negligence with humans can cost you five hundred thousand or five million dollars and so uh, malpractice insurance is much higher right obviously for um, people who work with human with people who work with bipeds. And, um, um, so I, as a general approach, I think if we could figure, you know, put it this way, if you had an expense account where the people authorize, where your bosses did not care how much you spent on lunch, they just said, we'll pay for your lunch no matter what, um, you'd have a lot more lobster, steak and lobster for lunch than if you were capped, um, at like. 20 bucks and then anything over it came out of your pocket right and um a lot of the distortions in the healthcare system come from this mismatch of people not actually the actual consumers or users of the care um feeling um inoculated from the actual price 
to somebody else and see what happens from there. How you get rid of that at this point, I have no freaking clue. I mean, I really don't. Um, and, um, you know, I hear anecdotal things about this healthcare system or that healthcare system that was good. I never know if that's actually emblematic or if that's just one person's experience because they happen to, you know, be able to go to the right kinds of hospitals and all that kind of thing. Um, I do know every every everybody every congressman and senator I know from a northern border state, you know, talks about how um, the Canadians still cross the border all the time for health care. You know, the lines there are crazy. It's funny. I was actually, you know, I'm a huge fan of the Telegraph's um, Ukraine, um, the latest podcast. And uh, about a month ago, they had um, this woman who works as a, a Ukrainian woman who helps Ukrainian refugees in the UK sort of get acclimatized and work the system and all that kind of stuff. And it was really fascinating. <laughs> She's like, yeah, one of the things that really frustrates the Ukrainians is who come here, re Ukrainian refugees who come here, is how bad the British healthcare system is. And um, like apparently, according to this woman, and I mean, it wasn't like she was there to do be anything but grateful to the UK for taking in refugees, and she wasn't there as a health health policy person. So I'm taking her anecdotes as actually <laughs> representative of reality. Um, she was like, yeah, you know, like in the Ukraine. All of our medical stuff is digitized. We do everything, all the portals to get appointments. It's all online. You can get to the dentist in a day, you know, two days. You can get doctor's appointments the same week. Um, and, uh, and you can do it all online. It's great. And then you come to the UK and you get these letters from NHS giving you an appointment in six weeks or six months, depending on what the thing is. And so she was saying there were actually, she actually knew and had relatives, I believe, who would fly back to Ukraine for dental appointments rather than wait in the UK. And um, that tells me something, right? I mean, and, you know, and there are lots of reasons for why this stuff gets expensive, bowel moles, disease, and all the, all the rest. But um, I do not think that uh, the sort of Bernie Sanders approach would make things better, um, even in the aggregate, right? I mean, you know, like, you know, there's a whole utilitarian argument about Sure, it would make things worse for the one percent or the top twenty percent, but it would make things better for the people in the bottom fifty percent or something like. I don't believe that's true. I really don't. But I also think that the current system is really, really bad. And one of the problems that Republicans got themselves into during the Obamacare thing was um, refusing to acknowledge that the current healthcare system in America sucks and does need to be reformed. Instead, they put all their eggs in what Obama wants to do was terrible. But we have no alternative, and um, and if you say that to a wonk, you know, if you say that around like Jim Capretta or some, you know, one of our healthcare policy guys, they'll break a bottle and try to cut you because they had plans, right? There were there's smart wonks out there who have healthcare policy plans. Um, so it wasn't like the Republicans didn't have a alternative; it's that they had fifty alternatives and they couldn't agree on any one of them, which is the same thing politically as having no alternative. Several listeners had questions of conservative dorkery. Uh, for one, how would you explain the term paleocon for probably the vast majority of people in this country and even among listeners who don't understand it? And where do you think it fits into conservatism today? I thought it was really subtle and ironic the way you asked that question. How would you <laughs> answer what paleocon is? I mean, I heard that. I mean, it's like. It Next, you're going to be telling me that, you know, I should listen to more Wagner. I'm sorry, Za Wagner. Hey, I, did, um, no, hey, um, I did serve bagels this morning, appropriately enough. Um, so, stipulated that there are paleocons who will not like this answer. But then again, there are a lot of paleocons who do not like me. So I was going to say, would they um, like you, whatever you said? No, that's the, that's the point. It's like like the, 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 the lack of good faith from a lot of them. Um, makes it impossible to have this conversation but um the first thing to remember is just, just i'm not talking about the like the underlying philosophy of paleocons so is very old and we can have a different conversation about that in a second but the term paleocon is more recent than the term neocon and that's the important thing to keep in mind is that paleocons in the early 80s started calling themselves paleocons to differentiate themselves from the neocons. 
um, because the word neo, the phrase neocon came first, as um, and there's there are arguments about who coined it, and I don't, I can I can trust me, I can do them, but we're not going to do that here. Um, but for people who don't know, you know, neocons were disproportionately Jewish, but there are a lot of non-Jewish neocons. A lot of paleocons do not want to acknowledge that sometimes. Um, not all of them, but quite a few. Um, and uh, and the great Ur battle of neocons versus so-called paleocons um, was over Bill Bennett, Catholic, by the way, um, who Reagan appointed to uh, head, I think it was the National Endowment for Humanities, in 82, over this guy, Mel Bradford, who was um, not a neocon. And, um, and so the people who rallied to Bradford uh, came to be known or came to style themselves as paleocons because they didn't like these new interlopers into conservatism. Um, and so uh, the, some of the different flavors of paleocon really depend on which neocons they don't like, right? Because they're again they're differentiating themselves, um, and uh, I think that the way the way I would define a paleocon today is just simply um, someone who claims because I think often they are full of fecal matter on this stuff, but someone who claims to be representing the truer, more authentic um, strains of American conservative thought. Uh, uh, early National Review, rightly understood kind of thing. There is a big subsection. That, like, I, look, let me put it this way. I don't think all people who would use the term paleocon are bad people by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know that Michael Brennan Doherty would still call himself a paleocon, but he is certainly paleocon adjacent. I think he's a wonderful guy, really smart. I disagree with him on a bunch of things. I don't think he's a, there's a bigoted bone in his body. He's a decent human being, yada, yada, yada. And there are a lot of people like him out there. Um, so I don't want to be too sweeping and, and insidious about this. At the same time, um, there is a subset of the paleocon crowd that is um, uh, deeply invested in the lost cause stuff of the South, and um, and the most amazing manifestation of this was actually not paleo conservatives but paleo libertarians. Who of the sort of Lou Rockwell strike, who um, kind of really rallied around. I mean, they'll deny this. They'll say, look, we were about states' rights and federalism and all these kinds of things. Well, you didn't have to scratch too deep, you know, about some of the people who would like write at places like VDARE. Um, you didn't have to scratch too deep to find this bizarre oxymoron um, lurking amidst the muck, which was of libertarians for slavery um which is just uh so philosophically problematic it's really difficult to get your head around and um uh and so today i i feel like the i mean maybe chronicles still calls itself paleo conservative i don't know and i don't much care but for the most part it feels like the paleocon types have basically given up calling themselves paleocons because they don't like the word conservative now. And instead they call themselves nationalists. And one of the great and, and tragic things uh, of, of this moment is that some of the worst enemies of the former paleocon crowd, the sort of the Claremont um, Institute crowd, um, are now essentially paleocons. They're just under the, under the flag of nationalism instead of paleoconservatism. Um, and I think it's sad and pathetic and weird and not everybody at Claremont, there are good people there still, but, uh, it certainly, if you go by the, in, their internet presence, you know, their Twitter presence and that kind of thing and their, their involvement in politics, the, 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 the crazy weird people are really, um, drowning out the decent, sane, smart people. From one question that may make you uncomfortable to another, a listener asked, would you summarize your disagreements with or criticisms of Russell Kirk's for conservative mind? Is there anything worthwhile in it? And where would you point to a better view of conservatism? I think that there's a lot to be. I mean, there's a lot that's worthwhile out of 
the conservative mind and um and in Kirk's writing generally. I mean, I, not, I never got into his ghost stories, um, but uh, you know, John Miller tells me they're great. Um, Kirk is a very smart guy. He knew a lot of things about a lot of things, and I just don't necessarily. I I, I don't like the particularly sort of gothic cobwebby style of writing that he does um that's the way it felt to me i felt felt like it was work reading some of his things um um and so just stylistically really not not my cup of tea necessarily but he's you know he's more lucid and 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 readable than a lot of people um that that even some people that i agree with just just wasn't for me um i think that uh his theory of the case about conservatism rests way too much on basically here are the writers I really like going back the last 400 years and I'm going to string them together and assert that they are uh they define American conservatism and I I I just don't find that necessarily persuasive I also find look I mean I'm of a school that says there were lots of things called conservatism there were lots of strands of conservatism in American um intellectual and public life prior to let's call it 1945 um but there was no conservative ideology qua ideology, right? There was definitely libertarianism of one stripe or another, like an actual ideology ideology of freedom. Um, Herbert Spencer, all these guys, they spent a lot of time thinking about these things. There was certainly sort of the Manchester liberalism version of all of that that goes back to the founding, if not earlier. Um, but conservatism as an ideology is really a product of the post-World War II moment. And... Um, uh, and really a product of anti-communism. Um, like if you go back and you look at Ron Radosh's book, Prophets of the Right, about all these right-wingers from the 1910s and 1920s and 1930s. I love Ron Radosh. Some of his stuff on communism is fantastic. It's like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I mean, it's like John Dewey is one of the right-wingers in it. You know, it's this, um, it was so, the notion of what constituted right-wing was so distorted by the issue of communism on the left that, you know, again, this is a big part of my argument in, in, in liberal fascism is that um, one of the reasons why we so tightly associate fascism with being right wing is that according to Stalin's theory of social fascism issued in, I think, 32, um, it was a fatwa that went out that said any form of, uh, progressivism or socialist politics that isn't loyal to Ma Moscow is objectively fascist or objectively right-wing. And, um, and the problem was a lot of useful idiots in America believed it. So there was a time um, when, according to the Communist Party in the United States, FDR was a, a fascist and a right-winger. John Dewey, fascist go down the list of all these very progressive left-wing guys got called right-wingers and fascists. Trotsky, you know, he described fascism as right-wing socialism. I think he's right that it was right-wing socialism. But, like, on a spectrum that considers socialism left-wing, it still means it's left-wing. It's just a different flavor of socialism. And so, um, anyway, my, my, the only reason I get, I'm going down that rabbit hole is to explain that sort of this notion of sort of liberty loving uh fusionist um limited government the founding was super terrific awesome um conservatism that i grew up with um that you looked at from abroad from the refrigerator box that you were raised in um uh that ideology was kind of new um and you know, so Russell Kirk liked to quote this guy, H. Stewart Hughes, uh, who would say, ideology is the negation of conservatism. And Kirk really believed in a lot of ways, in this sense, he was authentically Burkean, right? That ideology was the kind of stuff that spills out of uh, French and German labs with poor quality control, right? And then it infects people's brains and people go crazy. And that's how you get the French Revolution. That's how you get all, that's how you get communism. That's how you get these terrible things. And meanwhile, conservatism with a small c rejects all this abstraction, rejects all of these highfalutin um, um, 
concepts and instead deals with the real world from the ground up rather than from above, right? So like Glorious Revolution, good. French Revolution, bad. Um, American Revolution, good, because it actually took human nature into account, right? We were all built from the crooked timber of humanity and never made straight and all that stuff. And so the the so I don't blame Kirk for not liking a more robust, affirmative, proactive, ideological definition of conservatism. But I'm much more in agreement with Tom Sowell, who once wrote that it takes an ideology to beat an ideology. And in the context of the Cold War, in the context of the post-New Deal era, um, you actually had to think through your dogmatic positions and lay them out and come up with a coherent ideological response to what you perceived as external threats and internal threats. And that's the process that yielded us conservatism. And this is one of the reasons why I really have always thrown a lot of shade on the way people talk about neoconservatism, because a lot of the so-called paleocon types talk about neoconservatism as being this product of... Uh, you know, it's all these ex-communists who like became conservatives and we can't trust them. And they point out like Irving Kristol was, you know, a Trotskyite for like 10 minutes. Um, and they point to a few others like that, um, which is all fair. It's fine. And it's absolutely true that Irving and these guys were disillusioned by communism and became conservative because of it. That's absolutely true. But then you go back and you look at the founding masthead of National Review and it's full of like much more impressive communists or ex-communists. You know, uh, you know, Max Eastman um, uh, was like Trotsky's literary agent and um, and translator. Um, James Burnham was uh, the editor of the Daily Worker and um, very close friends with with Trotsky and all those guys. Uh, Whitaker Chambers was a friggin' Soviet spy. Um, uh, you just go down the list; they're all these former communists and. Um, and so anyway, I think my problem with Kirk stem from his belief that conservatism really is just a bunch of personality traits. It's the pluralization of a bunch of personality traits in American literary history, and that conservatism is a more literary thing. It's more regional, blah, blah, blah. It's much more tolerant of things like the Jim Crow South. I'm not saying necessarily about Kirk, but about that, the sort of the world of Kirk fans have more nuanced views on a lot of those kind of things. And, um, and you got to remember like, you know, as, as Matt Connetti writes about in his book, the reason why Hayek does his whole, why I'm not a conservative spiel at the Mount Pelerin society was to reject Russell Kirk's definition of conservatism. Um, Cause Kirk in Hayek's view, and I would agree was much more enamored with the sort of European definitions of conservatism, natural aristocracies, the role of authority, all these kinds of things. And, um, um, and so it's a good faith thing. I met, I've met Kirk's wife a few times and, and, um, um, and I always feel bad when I, I sound like I'm trying to anathematize the guy. I think he's an important contributor. I just, he's not my cup of tea. Uh, a few lighter questions to end on. Uh, one and no man, we're going to marathon. Uh, it's true. Yeah, well, a few later <laughs> questions for the next hour and a half. A listener asks, "What's the best book to screen adaptation?" And he says, "I immediately think of Dune, Lord of the Rings, and dare I say, Game of Thrones, given that it fell off a cliff once they abandoned the books." But could you think of a different one, or would you agree with one of those? I mean, I agree. I, I certainly agree. The latest Dune is a good adaptation. Obviously, you still lose things. Um. I got to say, I was just talking about this with somebody at my cigar shop the other day. Uh, I think the adaptation of Man in the High Castle, at least the first, I guess, for two seasons of it, was better than the book. Um, the book is super trippy with this I Ching stuff that I don't, I still don't understand. Um, but uh, I thought the sort of the cinematography um, and the atmosphere, so the atmospherics of the the screen adaption of Man on High Castle for Amazon Prime was really great. Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like there's some like obvious 
answer to this. I suspect that All the President's Men is better as a movie than it is as a book. But um, and I, you know, I, I, I never read The Godfather. Um, I have friends who say it's a great book. Um, but my sense is, is that the it, it one of the very few cases you can probably point to where the movie version is closer to real literature than the book that it's based on. Um, um, and certainly, I, I mean, how could you possibly argue that that it was a very successful screen adaptation of a book? I mean, even if the book is a thousand times better, it, it did pretty well. I don't know. I mean, I was just going through on IMDb uh, all the various titles that Stormy Daniels was in. I'd have to go back and check to see if any of them were books. For, for purposes of researching a column, of course. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> not, not as a special birthday treat. Uh, um, a, a separate listener asks, what are your thoughts on the ethics of dog sled racing? I think they've gotten a lot better. Um, they used to, in the old days, treat those dogs that couldn't make the run very badly, you know, in the, in the Iditarod and all that. I am sure there are some unethical people who do unethical things still, but I've visited at least twice dog sled places in Alaska, um, and it's it's not what it once was. The thing that um, I think people need to understand about sled dogs, right or wrong, eugenics whatever you know we have different arguments but they really like pulling things i mean they just really dig it and um uh they were bred to do it they enjoy it they love all being together um and if you're going to have a like i i, I don't think you can make the same case for the you know the the horse carriages in new york city those horses don't seem to be particularly happy but like dog sledding dogs maybe they don't want to do it you know the thousand miles whatever it is of the iditarod but um they like pulling sleds for sure um i know a guy who goes skajording i think that's how you pronounce it you know skajording um, uh, it doesn't ring a bell no yeah so it is basically using essentially sled dogs um uh for uh you wear a harness and you attach it to the dogs and you do cross-country skiing with a couple dogs helping you go up the uphill stuff and that kind of thing and helping you go a little faster on the downhill stuff. It's supposed to be a lot of fun, still a lot of work. Just like the dogs aren't going to just pull you. You have to do your share. Um, but uh, um, it's also worth pointing out, like the, in the movies, all the sled dogs are these big ass huskies um, and Samoyeds, and, which are beautiful, just freaking beautiful dogs. Um, but the way to think about them is they're essentially the tugboats of, uh canine locomotion um in that they don't move really fast and they're for pulling heavy loads the speed dogs are much smaller they're like 50 60 pounds lean um much much scrappier looking um but regardless they like it and so you shouldn't work them to death you shouldn't be cruel to them um but like the sled drivers i've talked to uh, they tend to eat Snicker bars on the long races, and they cook stew for the dogs. I mean, the dogs are treated pretty well. Uh, I, I thought this was fun and quite clever. If you could wave a magic wand and conduct a social political experiment without any ethical, financial, or logistical concerns, what would oh, you dear. do? So this is this is one of the problems of not getting the questions in advance because I feel like I could actually come up with a really good answer to this. I mean, obviously. We would, again, if 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 it wasn't going to hurt anybody, all these kinds of things, and like if we could do it, do it as an AI program that um, accurately mirrored actual human responses, so you knew you weren't using humans as instruments of stuff. But we would just basically take every set of identical twins born in America and put them in really different circumstances, um, you know, fighting pits versus accounting school, you know. And just see what comes out of all that. Um, beyond that, um, I think it's a great question. I'm going to return to it on the next AMA. You can say, John, have you given any more thought about this? And I will have a better answer because I think it's 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 uh, too good a question to waste on something um, completely off the cuff. Um, at the same time, it's you know, let's also say it's it's 
kind of an evil question. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like if you could be czar where you had didn't have to pay respect to any human rights whatsoever, what would you do to make you know the country better? Like it's we don't want to live in a society that that actually would make this question viable. But um, someone but, also uh, asked, which we may also want to say for the next one. If you were dictator for a day, what one policy would you institute? All right, well, I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a few, and then we'll sort of figure it out, right? So one, I would ban public sector unions. I'm not sure that's, like, if I only had one wish, that would be the one. But, like, uh, that's definitely somewhere on my top 10, top 20 list. Um, I would um, probably get rid of withholding on taxes. Um, and um and probably come up with some sort of well so two different ones one i would try to come up with something along the lines of a consumption tax instead of an income tax but two um if we're going to have the income tax i would get rid of withholding so that people actually understand what um you know what they're being forced to pay for in a more concrete way i would um probably make tax filing day the same day as election day um so that you could actually vote on the back of your check for your candidate because that way you would get be getting what you pay for it's amazing how what a coincidence it is, is that april 15th and and november 7th are almost as far apart as humanly possible on the calendar because they want to separate the product from the price um uh what else i would um I just don't know that a dictator can do this, but I would, um, if there was some mechanism by which I could do it, I would completely flip the political pyramid in the United States and um, invest. I mean, this is more magical thinking than it is like pass a law or issue an edict. But um, long time listeners and readers know I'm kind of all in on the federalism stuff. And I would want the federal government to just handle a handful of things most of the ones that are basically spelled out in the constitution and then push everything down to the most local level possible i um 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 but i don't need to do my whole federalism spiel here i would for example though take most of the cabinet agencies and um and hand them off to the states right and so the the best example of this is uh, veterans, uh, the VA hospitals or the VA healthcare system. Um, it's a total mess. It's a total outrage. It does a bad job. I know Trump says he fixed it. He didn't fix it, but it may, I think he probably made it better, but he didn't fix it. And um, we should, if we're going to have a VA system, which I don't think we necessarily should, I, I would have much better, I'd be much more comfortable just giving veterans basically free healthcare gift certificates to take on the open market wherever they want to go rather than have to rely on VA hospitals. But um, regardless, the reason I bring up the VA hospitals is the problem we have now is that every five, 10 years, there are these terrible scandals about what a just complete mess they are, um, where whistleblowers get fired, where people who cover up crimes get promoted, um, scandal after scandal. And, um, all 435 members of Congress, um, or 535 if we include the Senate, are outraged by it. And they say, this must never happen again. No one gets blamed because it's the system. It's the bureaucracy. It's this amorphous thing. Um, and the more local you can push these functions, uh, the easier it is to know who to fire. Um, the easier it is to know who to hold accountable for successes and failures. And so I would, maybe with a big check stapled to them, you know, if there's a veterans hospital in Arizona, it's no longer a federal thing. It belongs to the state of Arizona. Here's, you know, $500 million to work out the kinks, and now you're in charge of it. And just send these functions to the most local level possible so that um, uh, the people closest to the problems are the ones in charge of the problems. And that's not how our federal system works. I would invert the pyramid. Where have you never traveled that you'd most like to visit? Oh, big chunks of Asia. I really want to go to Hong Kong. Never been to Hong Kong. Um, I mean, maybe not right now, alas. 
Uh, but um, I really want to go to Argentina. I've never been to Argentina. Um, I would love to go to Buenos Aires. I hear the dollar goes a long way there right now. Um, I used to be fascinated with Malta. I still haven't been, but my understanding is that Malta has not leveraged its exotic sounding past, its exotic past and exotic sounding sort of brand with actual quality investments in its tourist infrastructure. Um, so I'm less, less keen on it. I'd love to go to Morocco. Um, I really don't want to go back to Russia um, for the foreseeable future. Um, I don't know. I mean, at some point, I'd love to see parts of China. I've never been. I mean, I, I really haven't. I've been to Japan um, as a young man. My decision tree went somewhat awry there. Uh, mistakes were made. Um, uh, but I had a really good time. That's, that's the mistakes were made part. This, and, was with, um, um, this was when you were on Think Tank, right? Yeah, it was when I was. We produced a bunch of shows in Japan. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, really interesting. Like to go back. Um, but I haven't been to China. I haven't been to. If I could travel the way I wanted, I would love to go to India. Um, but like the idea of budget travel in India just leaves me cold. Um, um, and at some point, I, my wife really, really wants to go to Australia. Um, and my problem is, is like the amount of time you have to take off to justify that flight. Um, you know, you don't go to Australia for a couple of days, you know, you, you gotta go. Um, I just haven't been able to claw out that kind of time. So there are a lot, I know there are a huge number of places. Um, it's really no place in the United States that I haven't been to one extent or there's no state I haven't been to. Um, uh, you know, there's some states I'd like to go spend more time in. I feel like I really have not given Rhode Island its due. Um, but uh, I don't know. I w Top of my list, I guess, would be like Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Taiwan. Um, one of those guys. I'd really like to see those places. Uh, speaking of the third Jessica, who has clearly played Mighty Spoonie before, I thought this would be a fun one to end on. If the third Jessica divorced you and John Van Horitz's wife divorced him and the two of you were forced to move in together into a Manhattan apartment, <laughs> what kind of hilarity would ensue and would you be able to share it without making each other crazy? Um, for those who don't get it, this is an odd couple joke. But um, I think the thing to know is that Pod would definitely be Felix, and I would be Oscar. Uh, I think Pod is much more of a control freak than I am. Um, I don't know that he's actually a neat freak, but um, I think he's uh, he's more like Felix than I am. I will put it that way. And um, um, although neither of us are really qualified to be sports writers, um, um, and um, um, and neither of us would be photographers either. But like, I think he's gonna. I'm gonna hear about this from him in the next 48 hours, and um, and we'll see. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think we would make terrible, terrible, terrible boyfriends. I just want to be. Just, I just put it out there like that. Um, I don't know that. Uh, um. And like, I can't get my mind around like inviting the Pigeon Sisters on a double date with Pod. That's just not. That's not. That's just not a direction I need to go. So, um, with that mental image, thanks everybody for tolerating this. Uh, we'll see if Pod still thinks the AMAs are good. Um, I'm. I'm. I'm always skeptical, but uh, it is what it is. And you know, anything that's not a solo is good by guy. They can't be any um, worse than that, Jonah. I'm. T I'm Team and, Pod uh, for a change. Um, and other than that, I'll see you next time.